Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is cutaneous malignancies. I'm going to begin with an overview of ultraviolet radiation and its effect on the skin, and then I will discuss cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma, and melanoma, the big three of cutaneous malignancies. So how does sunlight affect the skin? As you know, it is the ultraviolet portion of sunlight that actually causes the damage. Now, we principally will think about UVA and UVB, which have different wavelengths. And we know that cumulative sun exposure, particularly of UVB, is associated with cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. By contrast, intense intermittent sun exposure, so those really bad occasional sunburns, are what is associated with basal cell carcinoma and melanoma. Now, as you're all aware, melanin is protective because not only can it scatter UV radiation, but it can absorb its energy. So UV radiation ranges in wavelength from about 100 to 400 nanometers. And this is important because the peak absorption for DNA is at about 250 nanometers, right in that sweet spot. And when DNA absorbs that energy, it can cause pyrimidine dimers. So as you recall, pyrimidines are thymine and cytosine. And if you have two adjacent uh, pyrimidines on the backbone, you can get formation of a dimer. And I'll show you an image of that in a moment. Now, when this happens, you're going to need nucle nucleotide excision repair to correct that lesion. Most of the time, of course, you'll have an accurate correction, but sometimes you'll get mistakes. And what we will typically see will be a C to T or a CC to TT tandem mutation. And this is so characteristic of UV radiation that it's referred to as the UV radiation mutational signature. So what UV radiation does to the skin is we have widespread DNA damage and extremely high mutational loads. So what does this look like? Here we can see a DNA backbone with two uh, thymine uh, residues here. If you hit this with UV light, these uh, carbon double bonds can absorb that energy, thereby forming a cyclobutane ring. Now, when this happens, you no longer have the neat uh, fitting together of your, uh, your bases, and you're going to get bulging out uh, like this, which the cell will sense, and nucleotide excision repair will be initiated to replace uh, this uh, lesional uh, area with the appropriate uh, nucleotides. Now, the importance of nucleotide excision repair in ultraviolet uh, light damage is highlighted by uh, certain kindreds that have mutations in the nucleotide excision repair uh, genes. And this leads to a disease called xeroderma pigmentosum. And individuals with this uh, disease are more prone to cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas and basal cell carcinomas. All right, let's begin now with our first lesion, which is not an actual malignancy, it is a pre-malignant lesion. This is actinic keratosis, which can lead to squamous cell carcinoma. They will appear as a rough, scaly patch in sun-damaged skin, usually less than about a centimeter, and they can be associated with ionizing radiation, industrial hydrocarbons, and arsenic. And in this setting, they tend not to be associated with sun-exposed skin. We'll see mutations in TP53 and other genes that are mutated in squamous cell carcinoma, which we'll address in a moment. And as with all of the ultraviolet uh, radiation-associated malignancies, they're more common in individuals with lightly pigmented skin who lack the protection of melanin. Now, histologically, we're going to see basal cell hyperplasia with cytologic atypia, elastosis, which will be uh, bundles of atypical elastin fibers in the superficial dermis, and parakeratosis. And I'll show you uh, all of this in a moment. Clinically, most of these lesions are stable or will regress, although about 0.1 to 2.6 will progress each year to a squamous cell carcinoma. And because of that risk of progression, as well as for uh, cosmetic uh, reasons, we'll use cryotherapy or topical agents to remove the lesion. Now, here are some examples of actinic keratoses in a variety of skin types. You can see it here uh, in this classic example from Robinson Kumar Basic Pathology in an individual with very lightly pigmented skin. Here is this lesion. There's uh, erythematous scaly patch. And then you can also see these actinic keratoses uh, in these uh, three individuals of Asian descent. Uh, in these two, you can see this uh, erythematous uh, patch. Uh, and here we have a uh, pigmented lesion, and we sometimes will see melanin pigment uh, in these lesions. Now, when we look uh, at the histology, you can see immediately your eyes will be drawn to this uh, homogeneous blue-gray material that we associate with sun damage, uh, and this is the solar elastosis. Now, the, over up, uh, the overlying epidermis is going to show parakeratosis, so we have uh, th this thick uh, uh, 
uh, scale here on the surface, which is uh, retaining the nuclei. So that's parakeratosis, as opposed to just hyperkeratosis, where the nuclei are lost. And you can see uh, at this power, we have a tipia, mostly in the bottom third. Uh, on this um, higher power, you can appreciate uh, just how extensive the um, uh, the atypia is, but also how limited. So it really tends to spare the, uh, the upper third of this lesion. So that's what we see in actinic keratosis. Now let's talk about what we will see in squamous cell carcinoma. So as I mentioned earlier, it's associated with cumulative uh, UV radiation, that widespread uh, DNA damage, extremely high mutational loads. The uh, lesions that we tend to see genetically will be uh, mutations in TP53. As you recall, P53 is our guardian of the genome. That's that protein that holds everybody still so DNA repair can take place. And in fact, we know that in squamous cell carcinomas that arise with this ultraviolet mutational signature, about 90% of them will have mutations in TP53 which is going to set up for progression to additional, for additional mutations to accumulate. We also can see loss of function of the notch receptor, which is involved in uh, the orderly maturation of squamous epithelia. So mutations uh, in this pathway are seen in about 80% uh, of cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas. And then another pathway that can be affected is a gain of function of the RAS protein, which leads us to a, a highly proliferative state. Again, more common in individuals with lightly pigmented skin who lack the protection of melanin. And they also can be increased uh, risk in uh, patients who are immunosuppressed. And then a final category to think about for squamous cell carcinoma, and what is more common in individuals with darkly pigmented skin, will be squamous cell carcinomas that arise in association with chronic inflammation and scarring such as burns. And in this context, these squamous cell carcinomas tend to have more aggressive behavior. As I mentioned earlier, you can get uh, cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas arising from actinic keratoses, and while locally aggressive, they have delayed metastasis. Now, metastatic risk is going to be associated with depth of invasion. The greater the depth, the higher the risk, uh, as well as the uh, site. So uh, cutaneous uh, squamous cell carcinomas of the ear, as well as squamous cell carcinomas of mucosal surfaces, tend to uh, metastasize earlier. So what will we see when we are looking at a squamous cell carcinoma? Clinically, if it's an in situ lesion, it will be somewhat similar to an actinic keratosis, but more so. So a hyperkeratotic plaque, which may even have formed a nodule. When it becomes invasive carcinoma, you're going to get more of a nodular form. It will be scaly, and we can see surface ulceration. And about 4% of these will be metastatic at diagnosis. Histologically, in squamous cell carcinoma, highly atypical cells at all levels of the epidermis, which will distinguish it from an actinic keratosis, will see nuclear crowding and disorganization. And once we become invasive squamous cell carcinoma, you may see something like a well-differentiated squamous cell carcinoma with keratin pearls and obvious uh, desmosomes attaching your keratinocytes. Uh, you can have moderately differentiated or all the way to poorly differentiated where you may not even be thinking about a squamous cell carcinoma at all. It can be an anaplastic or necrotic, and it may shade uh, show dyskeratosis, which is when you get single cell keratinization. So let's look first at the uh, histologic appearance of uh, squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Uh, and you can see again, here we have our elastosis, which is confirming this is occurring in, uh, in uh, sun-damaged skin. Uh, it's thought that the damaged fibroblasts uh, are making uh, atypical elastin fibers here. The next thing you'll notice will be how sharp and clean the basement membrane is, uh, so we don't have an invasive carcinoma, but we do have this full thickness atypia. And then, of course, overlying this, we have our uh, hyperkeratosis uh, with some areas with parakeratosis. Now, when we start uh, thinking about uh, squamous cell carcinoma that's invasive, let's take a look first at the uh, clinical appearance. And here you can see squamous cell carcinomas uh, arising uh, in a variety of different skin types. Uh, this is an invasive carcinoma on the leg of an African-American woman. Uh, you can see here uh, we have two lesions that are arising on the sun-exposed skin of the nose uh, for a darkly pigmented uh, fungating mass here, an ulcerated lesion uh, here. And then this is a classic appearance. Uh, the ear is uh, commonly um, affected by invasive squamous cell uh, carcinoma. We have a nodule, which has got a little bit of surface uh, uh, ulcerations, some scale, erythema uh, around this area. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, this is a site that is prone to early metastasis. And here, in fact, we see a metastatic focus. All right, when we look histologically, 
Uh, you can see here in this low power view, here is the overlying uh, epidermis uh, next to the lesion. Uh, and then we have the invasive carcinoma, uh, which is broken through the basement membrane as an invading into the superficial dermis uh, in little uh, nests and tongues. And there is, of course, uh, an inflammatory response uh, here to this invasive tumor, uh, which, as you'll recall, because it has a high mutational burden, may have some neoantigens, which is spurring this inflammation. This is an example of a fairly well-differentiated squamous cell carcinoma, the type of image that you'll be asked most likely to uh, recognize on, on exams, uh, because it is quite classic. We see we have abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, and if you uh, take a closer look, you can see the desmosomes here, these uh, intercellular bridges uh, holding those keratinocytes together. Now, we uh, rarely so show you moderately differentiated or poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinomas because they really don't look like squamous cell carcinomas. But uh, for part of your education, I just want to share with you a moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma uh, so you can see uh, how these uh, can vary. All right, so that uh, brings us to the end of squamous cell carcinoma. Let's now turn our attention to basal cell carcinoma. So basal cell carcinomas, as you'll recall, intense intermittent sun exposure. And although these ca uh, carcinomas are very common, uh, fortunately, they are very slowly growing. And they may be locally aggressive, even to the extent of invading into the bone if they are neglected, but they rarely metastasize. And again, they're more common in individuals with lightly pigmented skin who lack the protective effect of melanin. Now, the pathogenesis is different from what we see in basal cell carcinoma. We see loss of function mutations in patch 1, which is a tumor suppressor gene that negatively regu regulates hedgehog signaling. And I'm going to show you a picture on the next slide. This will lead to constitutive activation of the hedgehog pathway, increasing uh, expression of downstream genes, leading to cell growth and increased survival. We also will see TP53 mutations in basal cell carcinoma. Now, um, a familial syndrome that highlighted the importance of patch 1 in the pathogenesis of basal cell carcinoma is Gorlin syndrome. And these individuals who have inherited defects in patch 1 typically will present with multiple basal cell carcinomas. So here is a, an image from uh, uh, Robin's pathologic basis of disease. You can see here that in the uh, happy, healthy cell, uh, patch is going to uh, bind to SMO, which uh, is a protein that stands for smoother, uh, and uh, it inhibits it. Now, when you have binding of sonic hedgehog, we're going to get dissociation of patch and SMO, which will then allow ligand-dependent signal transduction through the GLI-1 transcription factor, activation of gene expression, normal development, and tissue homeostasis. By contrast, if we have a mutation in patch 1, we no longer have this uh, binding to SMO, and therefore SMO is constitutively active, leading to ligand independent signal transduction, unregulated cell division, leading to abnormal growth, basal cell carcinoma. So what do basal cell carcinomas look like? So clinically, we're going to see papules, uh, raised lesions that frequently will have telangiectasia, which is dilated uh, capillaries. However, these may not be uh, apparent due to ulceration or uh, melanin pigmentation. And because basal cell carcinomas arise from follicular epithelium, they do not arise on mucosal surfaces. Histologically, we'll see tumor cells that resemble the cells of the basal cell layer, and they'll show peripheral palisading, so the nuclei will be lined up like a picket fence. There also is often a characteristic artifactual cleft that we see in processing, and the surrounding stroma will be mixoid, so somewhat mucousy uh, or fibrotic. There are two growth patterns, the multifocal superficial growth that originates from the epidermis, and nodular growth that grows downward into the dermis as cords and islands. So let's take a look uh, at the clinical appearance of basal cell carcinoma. Here you can see, again, what this looks like in a variety of skin types, which is very important because uh, older textbooks will refer to basal cell carcinoma as being a pearly papule, which is, in fact, what you can see. Uh, here's an example in lightly pigmented skin, nicely showing the ectatic uh, capillaries, the telangiectasia. But in uh, different skin types, you can see a different appearance. So here we have an individual with darker skin with a pigmented basal cell carcinoma, showing some variation in color, a lighter area here, an irregular border, so not forming a nice round pearly papule. This could mimic a melanin. Uh, this lesion as well, also an individual with darker skin pigmentation, has an irregular border, a scaly surface, some uh, variation uh, in color, could mimic a melanoma. 
Uh, this uh, individual here has uh, the classic ulceration uh, in this lesion on the nose, and then we have a more erythematous one uh, appearing on this individual. Now, when we look at all of these lesions histologically, this is a sort of uh, picture we'll see. This is in that uh, multifocal superficial growth pattern with multiple nests invading the superficial dermis. Uh, even at this power, you can appreciate the uh, surrounding cleft. This is just an artifact. This would not be something that uh, actually occurs uh, in vivo. And if we look on higher magnification, there's that cleft again where this tumor nest is pulling away from this fibrotic stroma. And you can see these basaloid uh, appearing nuclei uh, that are lined up like a little picket fence. Here's a bonus uh, mitosis for those of you who are interested. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our epidermal malignancies, squamous cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma. It's now time to turn to a malignancy of melanocytes, melanoma. So about 10 to 15 percent of patients with melanoma have an inherited autosomal dominant trait which has variable penetrance. So just because they have that allele does not mean that they will actually manifest a melanoma. Sporadic uh, melanomas, again, intermittent intense ultraviolet radiation. They can arise in dysplastic nevi, but most of them will be sporadic. And we have a different uh, distribution of the lesions depending on the degree of pigmentation in the individual skin. Individuals who have lightly pigmented skin tend to get melanomas on sun-exposed areas, whereas individuals with darker skin pigmentation tend to get them in not sun-exposed areas, so acral, so palms of the hands, soles of the feet, fingernails. The, there are multiple types of melanomas, uh, and the specialists will go on, for that, uh, on that for quite a while. I'm just going to mention a few uh, that I think are important. One is superficial spreading, which is the most common type of melanoma. Another type of melanoma is nodular melanoma, which is uh, more aggressive uh, than uh, superficial spreading, and I'll explain why that is when we talk about prognosis. And then it's also important to be aware of acral lentiginous melanomas, uh, because they're uncommon in individuals who are lightly pigmented and tend to be seen more commonly in individuals with greater skin pigmentation. So when you are evaluating a patient, don't omit looking at the soles of their feet, looking at their nails uh, on their palms of their hands. All right, let's talk about the pathogenesis of melanoma. There are three families of mutations that can lead to melanoma, uh, mutations that disrupt cell cycle control genes, those that activate pro-growth signaling pathways, and mutations that activate telomerase. So in the first category, we look at mutations of CDKN2A. This locus will uh, encode uh, three proteins, P15, P16, and ARF. So as you'll recall from our uh, discussion of retinoblastoma, uh, P16 uh, is important in regulating the cell cycle because it inhibits cyclin-dependent kinase 4 and cyclin-dependent kinase 6. What these do is they work with retinoblastoma tumor suppressor to block cells from going into the G1 phase. So it pauses that cell, allows uh, uh, any uh, changes to be uh, made, any uh, correction of mutations, etc. And if you lose P16, you no longer have anything that slows that cell down. It's going to accelerate right into G1 phase, synthesize its DNA, and go on through the cell cycle. Uh, now, if you have uh, mutations in ARF, as you recall from our discussion of P53, the guardian of the genome, what P53 does is it holds the cell steady when there is a mutation uh, or some sort of error in the DNA so it can be repaired. And P53 uh, is... Um, can be broken down by MDM2. So MDM2 binds to P53 and breaks it down. ARF will inhibit this. So if you lose ARF, then MDM2 will be abundant, will bind to P53, break it down, and you will no longer have this opportunity to correct uh, errors in your DNA. Another family uh, of mutations are those that activate the pro-growth signaling pathways, so RAS and PI3K AKT. And I'll show you uh, an image uh, in a moment. So you can see activating mutations of BRAF in about 40 to 50 percent of melanomas, and those uh, tumors also tend to have loss of P10. We can get activating uh, mutations of RAS in about 15 to 20 percent of melanomas, and melanomas that arise in skin that is not exposed to sun uh, tend to have activating mutations of KIT, which is a tyrosine kinase. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, and uh, these lesions will also tend to have P10 silencing. Now, despite uh, the, the number of mutations we see here, the most common mutations that we see in melanomas are those that activate telomerase. So we see that in about 70% of melanomas, particularly of the TERT gene, which uh, encodes the catalytic subunit of telomerase. 
All right, let's look at a signaling pathway diagram. This is not for you to memorize, um, just to get an idea of what is going on and how it all interrelates, as well as to give you uh, some hints about what to think about when we're talking about the treatment of melanoma. So uh, here we have KIT, uh, which is a re receptor tyrosine kinase, uh, which can be mutated in melanoma, uh, RAS, uh, P10, MDM2, uh, P53, P16, BRAF, all can be mutated uh, in melanoma. And these uh, uh, proteins here have a little asterisk uh, next to them. And then here uh, in red, you can see a variety of uh, pharmaceutical agents that can be used from tyrosine kinase inhibitors for KIT mutations uh, to CDK4-6 inhibitors when you have P16 uh, uh, knocked out, uh, mTOR inhibitors, etc. So just something to be aware of. Now, as we're talking about melanoma, we have to uh, digress for a moment to start talking about how melanoma actually grows because it has an impact on the clinical behavior. So we'll talk now about radial versus vertical growth phase. So in the radial growth phase, the melanoma is spreading horizontally within the epidermis and superficial dermis, and it seems to lack the capacity to metastasize, and this is going to be because it's not in that area where there are a lot of lymphatics or blood vessels for them to invade. And some of the melanoma lesions that are associated with this are lentigo maligna, which is an indolent lesion on the face of older patients, superficial spreading melanoma, which we already discussed, and acral mu or mucosal lentiginous melanoma, uh, the ones that are unrelated to sun exposure. So you actually have a fairly good lead time when you have uh, the radial growth phase because we're not uh, at risk for metastasis. That's why it's important to recognize these lesions early before they enter the vertical growth phase, which is what occurs when you get additional mutations. And at this point, the tumor cells are going to invade into the deep dermis as an expensile mass, and they have metastatic potential. So let's look at uh, a cartoon uh, that goes over the process of uh, the development of melanoma. So here you have happy, healthy skin with a melanocyte, which gets a gain-of-function mutation in BRAF or RAS, which is going to cause proliferation. And this is what we will call a junctional nevus uh, because we have a melanocytic proliferation. These are still benign melanocytes uh, at the dermal-epidermal junction, junctional nevus. Now, the next mutations that we'll see typically will be in telomerase, and then somewhere along this pathway we'll also get loss of P16. And this, uh, when we have this, in this initial um, uh, mutation, we'll be moving into early melanoma, so radial growth phase. So here you can see they're no longer uh, wild-type, happy, healthy uh, melanocytes. They are now mutated, and we are getting some very superficial invasion, but still quite a distance from our blood vessel. Uh, with uh, increasing mutational load, we're going to get advanced melanoma that is going to now go into the vertical growth phase, where at this point it has the potential to access uh, blood vessels and spread hematogenously. And then, of course, uh, once it does, we have metastasis, uh, and at this point in uh, advanced melanoma, we tend to have our P53 and P10 mutations. So let's look at what we see clinically. Uh, here you can see a classic example of melanoma. And uh, I'm going to use this as an example to go through the ABCs of melanoma. This is actually one of the reasons, perhaps, why uh, melanoma prognosis has improved, is that we've been doing a really good job of letting patients know and educating them about changes that can signify uh, melanoma. So one of the things that we look for in pigmented lesions is asymmetry. Uh, and you can see that this lesion is quite asymmetric. We can't draw a line and have it be uh, a uniform appearance, which is what we typically will see uh, for knee or benign moles. The border here is very irregular, somewhat jagged, uh, and we have variegated color. So we have a dark black um, uh, purple area here, reddish brown, almost a pink here, uh, lighter area here. And then uh, one thing for patients to keep an eye out for is increasing diameter. So if you have a lesion that is starting uh, to become larger, as well as just a, a mole uh, or pigmented lesion that is changing over time. So let's uh, take a look at uh, what this will look like histologically. Uh, so this is uh, a melanoma uh, that is still in its uh, radial growth phase. Uh, so you can see here it's still quite superficial. Uh, the lesional cells are here uh, up in the very superficial epidermis. Uh, you have nests them coming through, a large uh, group here, a few individuals streaming through here. 
Uh, and you'll notice that there is a fair amount of melanin uh, that is uh, distributed here in a somewhat uneven pattern. Uh, and that is because um, the, the melanin can be released uh, into the surrounding tissue where it is taken up by, uh, mal uh, by macrophages, which are then referred to as melanophages. Now, when we talk about prognosis, what we'll be looking at uh, will be the depth of invasion, which I'll talk about in a moment. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of that, but what we measure is called the Breslow thickness, which is from the top of the granular cell layer, so about here, to the deepest point of invasion. So in this superficial spreading, which is still up above our sebaceous glands, it's a pretty uh, small Breslow, Breslow thickness. But let's compare that to a nodular melanoma, which as I told you is a more aggressive lesion. One of the reasons it's more aggressive is because it is uh, in the vertical growth phase uh, and as I've already mentioned, that is associated with a worse prognosis. So you can see here, it's got a much, much larger uh, Breslow thickness. The distance from the granular cell layer top to the depth of invasion is going to be higher. Uh, now let's take a look uh, at what the cells look like. This is a, a medium power view where you can see these uh, atypical, somewhat epithelioid cells with abundant cytoplasm. Uh, and then there's this scattered, fine, dusty melanin pigment. Uh, which has a grayish brown appearance. On higher magnification, you can appreciate that uh, fine, uh, dusty melanin pigment. But the other feature I want to highlight for you are these prominent nucleoli. So uh, as pathologists, we'll frequently refer to the cherry red uh, nucleolus of uh, melanoma cells. So there's uh, one right there. Now, before we leave melanoma entirely, I want to show you some images of acrolentigenous melanoma. Uh, so here you can see uh, this is arising uh, on the toe of an individual with uh, darkly pigmented skin. Uh, and you can see that it's a flat lesion. So we don't have, uh, this is going to be still in the radial growth phase, but it does have uh, asymmetry of the border uh, and, uh, sorry, asymmetry. So it's not uh, a uniform uh, shape uh, and it has an irregular border. Here's another example of acrolentinous melanoma. This is arising in the nail bed, and you can see how this can mimic uh, a simple hematoma. Uh, and so you have to have a high degree of suspicion and be sure to examine your patients for these lesions. And finally, here's one uh, that is a very advanced uh, melanoma uh, arising on the sole of the foot. Let's just take a quick look uh, at what we see uh, histologically, keeping in mind that this is going to be radial growth phase, this is going to be vertical growth phase. And here's an example, perhaps from that very toe, where you can see it's acral because we have a very uh, thick stratum corneum, but we see that the melanocytes this, in this melanoma are still uh, staying very, very close. They're really at the de uh, dermal uh, epidermal junction. They have not moved into the dermis. It's still in the radial phase. If we catch this early, then we can uh, prevent this patient from having a metastasis. So I've talked a fair amount uh, about uh, different uh, skin pigmentation. Um, however, as you know, most pigmentation we relate as a society to socially defined race. And I wanted to share this uh, image for you from a research paper that's based on surveillance epidemiology and end results data, which uses socially defined race uh, as categories for looking at disease states. Now, to interpret uh, this particular graph, there are actually uh, several more uh, categories of uh, melanoma that uh, I have cut off because these are the three that are the most important and the ones we've discussed, acrolentigenous, superficial spreading, and nodular. So this is not referring to the degree of pigmentation uh, that the individual patients have, but is purely based on socially defined race, which is uh, a limitation. However, I would say that one of the challenges in doing this work is it would be good to do research like this uh, based on uh, the degree of skin pigmentation, but there has not been uh, a validated uh, color uh, system for looking uh, at skin. Uh, the Fitzpatrick uh, skin uh, scale, which is used, refers to how the skin responds to UV radiation. Does, so does one tend to, to burn or to tan or to freckle? But to return to this, I want to help you in, uh, interpret this because I think it's very critical for patient care. Uh, this uh, graph is showing so for each of these socially defined races, they took all of the melanomas that were seen in that particular uh, socially defined race, and they categorized them by subtype. 
Uh, and as I mentioned, there are two subtypes that I've removed. So you can see in the non-Hispanic white population that the vast majority of those melanomas will be superficial spreading type. Very uncommon for them to have acral lentiginous lesions uh, and uh, somewhat more common to have nodular lesions. But what I'd like to bring uh, your attention to is that we frequently will make an association of acral lentiginous with African descent. And you can in fact see that uh, uh, what they call here black, um, these patients do have about, about a third of the melanomas seen in this population will be acral lentiginous, but they also are about a third superficial spreading, uh, and about a quarter of them will be nodular melanomas. So please don't think that for your patients uh, who are of African descent, who are of different skin types, that they do not also get these other types of melanomas. It's very important that you, uh, you evaluate your patients uh, for any pigmented lesions. Uh, we do know that uh, we tend to have a delay in diagnosis uh, in uh, different uh, socially defined races, and this can uh, lead to a worse prognosis. So if we look purely at how we identify uh, prognostic factors based on the histology, it will be depth of tumor evasion, as I've mentioned, the Breslow thickness. Um, based on socially defined race, uh, the Breslow thickness may be uh, thicker due to delay in diagnosis. We also will look at the number of mitotic figures. And also, because as I've mentioned, with these uh, ultraviolet radiation-associated malignancy, we tend to have a high mutational load. That can lead to the production of neoantigens. This can cause a host immune response. And and if you have that host immune response, uh, that is suggesting uh, that uh, the body is working against this malignancy. And in fact, we take advantage of this because the tumor will respond to the host response um, by uh, trying to get around that. So we can use immune checkpoint inhibitors to circumvent that and let our immune system attack the tumor again. Uh, when we uh, have uh, metastases, they tend to go to regional lymph nodes, uh, and we will use this to determine uh, the spread uh, of a, uh, for the stage of a particular um, uh, tumor by doing a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Now, as you recall, the way we do this is we inject a uh, radio tracer dye uh, into uh, a tumor, and we will then uh, wait a certain amount of time for that to move to those first, uh, that first sentinel lymph node, which we will then biopsy. Here is an example of a sentinel lymph node biopsy. We had to use immunohistochemistry uh, for this particular lesion because there's only a small nest of tumor cells uh, here, which you can see uh, in melanoma. Uh, beyond that, melanoma can metastasize hematogenously to liver, lungs, brain, anywhere. Uh, and because melanoma is the great mimicker histologically, it always has to be on the differential diagnosis. Uh, the uh, primary treatment will be surgical excision, unless, of course, uh, we already have advanced disease, in which case we will look at BRAF and KIT inhibitors and immune checkpoint inhibitors. All right, this has been a very rapid run through the cutaneous malignancies. Uh, I'd like you to uh, take a look at these questions to review to see uh, what you've learned in the last uh, 30 minutes or so. Uh, as always, uh, thank you very much for your time, uh, and I appreciate your attention. So thank you very much.